You know, back when I was in the academy, we would follow every toast with a song. Everyone, welcome to the show. This is where no bubs has gone before. My name is Jay Record. Uh, with me is my father, Jake Record. And how are you doing today, Jake? I'm good, Jay. Thank you. So this show is an exploration of Star Trek: The Next Generation. Uh, it's a show that's dear to both your and mine's hearts. Um, debuting it in September of 1987. This show was actually the first show that I was allowed to stay up for, and we would actually watch together. Um, The show is formatted to where Dad and I are going to watch each and every episode of the entire run of Star Trek The Next Generation. And for each episode, we're going to convene here for a podcast and just discuss the episode, some of its themes, and just uh, reflect on the show in terms of what it means to us, um, what the show meant in itself, and kind of what our general reflections are now looking at it um, almost, God, how many years has it been? Uh, decades now mm-hmm. from when it first debuted. Um, so, Dad, before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit of your professional scientific background? Because I think some people at home would be interested to know about that. And then tell us a little bit of your um, history as a Star Trek fan or a Trekkie. Um. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I, I think I realized that I really had an interest in science because in high school, I was in honors English for all the last three years, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And in 11th and 12th grade, we had to write, do a term paper on a novel of some sort. And in 12th grade, um, I chose... Uh, Ray Brad- Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. Everyone else was doing their papers on traditional literature, Milton or F. Scott just Fitzgerald or Fitzgerald or Shakespeare or some, something like that. So, you know, I've always remembered that because I felt like I was unique that I was interested in science fiction at that time. Um, and then when I went to college, I Uh, majored in biology. And if you major in biology, you have to take a fair amount of chemistry. And where I went, you had to take a basic physics course also so that I was well steeped in sciences with the emphasis on biology during my college time. Um, As far as introduction to Star Trek, I can remember back, I think it was in 1966 when the original series came on. And that was a time where they were in Baltimore where I grew up, there were only four television stations then. And I, as I recall, Star Trek came on NBC. I don't remember what night and so forth, but I I, I can't remember. I think, I don't know if I saw the first shows because I remember stumbling on it or hearing about it from the newspapers or something like that. And I was fascinated by it because, um, you know, this was in the middle of the space race between the United States and the Russians in 1966. Mm -hmm. You know, we were three years away from the first landing on the moon. Um, And, you know, there was a lot of interest in in you know space travel, getting people into orbit successfully, and then making the jump to a lunar orbit, and then landing on the uh, moon, and then then I believe that the original series only lasted what three or four seasons. three seasons, three seasons, and then it was uh, canceled, and there was an outcry to bring it back, and I don't to NBC, and I don't I I, I recall they decided not to, 
And then there was still enough interest in Star Trek that it went into cartoons and things like that. And I was never into the Star Trek cartoons. Um, however, once into, I guess it was, uh, you might help me with this, Jay, you know, when the cast of the original series started making full length feature films, I was all into that. Yeah, so 1979. When, um, right, 19, well, and, and that was- Motion picture. Because, right, the motion picture. So, you know, that was a good, you know, um, almost 10 year, 10 plus year leap from the original series being on television to the first film. And at the same time, you know, you still had interest in science fiction and so forth, particularly, you know, space and visiting, learning about other species on other planets and so forth, because Star Wars came out in 1977, the first, the first Star Wars right. episode. And that was really significant. I think one of the most significant scenes and most enjoyable scenes in the first Star Wars was the bar scene mm -hmm. when they walked in and they tried to find Han Solo in the, the Millennium Falcon so they could have tra uh, trans transportation and just all those different aliens. And it, it was just an amazing thing. And it kind of makes me think it fit in with what, you know, Star Trek started to represent in terms of, you know, following up on the idea that's still prevalent with people is, are we the only ones here? Are there mm -hmm. other are there others others out others out there, and then in that just you know the cast of the original series through their um, you know full length feature films I think that obviously led into whatever year it was in uh, well yeah with in 1987 that Star Trek was rebooted as the next generation so interesting backstory to that um originally the motion picture was supposed to be a was supposed to be the reboot of a show um they were originally going to do a pilot for a new show and i don't know if you remember the guy he's supposed to play the captain um in the motion picture but kurt comes in and takes command from him the blonde fellow yes right yeah, 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 he was later on Seventh Heaven. I can't remember the actor's name, but he's actually in jail right now for um, molestation charges. <laughs> Believe it or not, crazy thing. But oh he was supposed he was supposed to be the captain of the new show, uh -huh. and uh -huh. the woman who uh, ended up playing V'ger, she was cast to play essentially, I think, the science officer. Huh. But they came in at the last minute and they decided there was really no interest for a show but because of Star Wars, as you mentioned, uh -huh. there had been a interest for a movie. So they right. basically rewrote the pilot episode into a new movie starring V'ger. Uh -huh. So 1987, 1987 comes around and there's an interest for a show finally at CBS. Right. But the problem is they can't afford the original cast and the original cast is older too, but they've already been in all these successful films and they're expensive to just cast for a weekly episodic TV show. So they come up with an entirely new cast that features, you know, um, Patrick Stewart as Captain Jean-Luc Picard, Jonathan Frakes as um, Commander William T. Riker, Marina Sirtis as Commander Troy, as a Lieutenant Commander Troy. Though we'll get mm -hmm. into that because they play with some interesting things with the rank in this first episode. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you have this new cast. So in 1987, this new show comes on. And, you know, since we're, we're there now, um, the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation is Encounter at Farpoint, which is actually a two-part episode. Um, you know, getting started, what do you think of this episode in general? I, you know, I thought about it and, and you know, we watched it uh, the day after Christmas and I watched it a couple of days ago again. And I think that since it was, you know, the reboot of a, um, a Star Trek television series with that uh, was occurring many years in the future after James T. Kirk and 
the the NCC 1701. I think they started out with the NCC 1701D yes. Enterprise. That it was a transitional show to kind of introduce the new crew. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 some of the things they 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 set out forth that would be covered in uh, future episodes of Next Generation and future seasons even was the relationship between Picard and Beverly Crusher, mm -hmm. the Jack Crusher, who was Beverly's husband, yes. had died. And, you know, there was, there was always a little bit of that uh, Picard seemed to have, was interested, had some romantic feelings back during Academy days for Be Beverly Crusher. Mm -hmm. And also it brought in Wesley, you know, Wesley helped win that. In, in the 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 far point episode because he you know had this desire to see the bridge and yeah. Picard did not want children on the bridge he was uncomfortable around children but when Beverly and uh, Wesley showed up on the bridge and were in the turbo lift and Picard saw how res how Wesley resembled his father he welcomed him into the bridge but then when Wesley knew too much and there was a problem and they got him out of there quickly. Yeah. Also, there was a... Well, I have a know, question about that for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what do you think about the introduction of children to the show? Because fans are really split on... Well, we're initially split on Wesley Crusher. He's looked at in a favorable view now. Um, but originally, a lot of people did not like will wheaton and they did not like the wesley crusher character on the show um you know i'm sort of prejudiced on that because having i haven't watched all of the the different iterations of uh the star trek uh genre but one that i've really i think you're just missing discovery right i have not i've watched I watched some of Discovery. I've watched some of Deep Space Nine. Uh, the only other one that I've really watched thoroughly, and I'm on, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I did it during the summer, and I started again. I'm just, I'm on the fourth season of Enterprise, so that's what it gives me a little prejudice because I think that, of course, Enterprise, you know, that series didn't come until 2001. I think that started, but you know, in that storyline which was even before the original series they brought up the issue that if you were going to have larger uh, uh, federation vessels and they were going to go on long missions into the mm -hmm. galaxy that from a social and psychological standpoint it might be important to have families on board starships so you know obviously Roddenberry and the writers and so forth, when they were writing uh, The Next Generation, they were already thinking about that, that mm -hmm. you know, we, need to, we need to change, make this different, different in that these ships are much larger, they're going on missions you know, for a longer period of time. It's gonna be important for the crew to have family members, um, which at the same time I find sort of, unusual because uh, one of the things that is uh, evident in all the Star Trek series uh, iterations is the intent is for the ships to be have an exploratory mission. Yes. However, whenever they go out and find somebody new, there's always friction. There's always, mm -hmm. they get into the same sort of geopolitical and power struggle issues that we um, find ourselves in still on earth to day there's an immense and, scale of danger to take children yeah, into yeah so you know it's really it's really you know it, it, on a practical basis in this this universe this next generation universe it's a real commitment for the crew members to bring their family along because you know they're 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 putting them into danger yeah um and so, so so when we're meeting characters like Wesley Crusher and Beverly Crusher, we have backstory built in with Picard. And Picard um, in himself is an interesting character that we'll touch on here for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, 
you grew up with Kirk. For mm-hmm. you, he's your captain. Right. I grew up with Jean Luc Picard. For me, he's my captain. Right. What was your initial reaction in September of '87, if you can remember, when you first saw Jean Luc Picard versus what you had grown up with with Captain Kirk? Yes, I do remember that, and it, it, that it just it, watching the Farpoint episode made me think of that. Is that Kirk was, you know, brash, but at the same time affable. Um, in the Farpoint episode, um, Picard comes back as uh, very intellectual, standoffish, mm-hmm. almost a martinet. Mm-hmm. Um, he, the way he treats Riker when Riker comes on board is like, you know, like this Picard guy is a real ass. Yeah. And then, then he kind of, you know, once he interviews Riker and ask him about, you know, how Riker, what Riker's opinion is in terms of his duty of protecting the captain of a starship, Riker passes that test and then um, Picard lightens up. And at the end of the episode, yeah, Picard lightens up so he shows more of his his human affable side, but he's very di- he remains very different from uh, Kirk. What do you think is the besides the brashness? I think the big difference between Kirk and Picard for me is, and it's funny that you bring up um, Enterprise because you're watching Archer right now. Right. And fans always used to be like, well, Kirk is a pirate. Kirk is a pirate. I was like, well, if Kirk's a pirate, then Archer's Gen- Genghis Khan at this point. <laughs> yes. um, you know, Archer's committing war crimes. He kind of has to, but yes. yeah, he is. Um, I think the biggest difference between Kirk and Picard is that Kirk carries this, I I guess, this kind of aloofishness to, he, he doesn't show any fear whatsoever, where Picard is just so focused in terms of his emotions that you don't ever really see anything outside of Picard, but when you do see emotion, you see these great flashes of it. Yes. Where it seems like with Kirk, like Kirk is always focused. Kirk is always steady. Kirk can get fiery, but you know, Kirk is Kirk. It it takes a, you have to get something out of Picard. Are you there? And of course, I don't know. I can't remember if this even came out in the original series, but how he, um, you know, was the only one to beat the Kobayashi Maru test is a testament to Kirk's, you know, uh, sort of his strength that he's mm-hmm. going to, he, he, while he's affable, he's going to do whatever the hell he pleases to accomplish his mission. Yes. Um, Kirk, you know, the, the, in, in another comparison is in the original series, you know, there's mention of the prime directive and so forth. And it's a little bit, you know, it's explained and understood. Yes, this is a big one we should touch on. But Kirk is a little bit loose with it as where Picard has this strong, much stronger moral, ethical uh, mindset. And he, you know, it comes up in uh, the next generation um, constantly. The, you know, what is the you know, what is the proper um, um, utilization, for lack of a better term, of the prime directive? Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I think for Picard, the prime directive is almost religion to him. Yes. Like, I, yes. He, out of all the things he can do, I think Picard always has two missions. Don't violate the prime directive and establish the safety of his crew where kirk multiple times in the original series and in the movie basically says my first responsibility is to my crew Mm -hmm. um to the point where you know i'll go out of my way to save them even if it means destroying someone else 
Mm-hmm. Um, Picard doesn't have that. Picard still has the prime directive to the point where he will sacrifice some people if it means adhering to the prime directive, which we'll, we'll see later on in other episodes, um, yeah. like episode three, Code of Honor, where this comes up again. Yeah, I agree with that. Picard really struggles as where Kirk, Kirk, it was there for Kirk, but he didn't struggle with it like, yeah. uh, like uh, Picard does. Yes, very true. Um, so let's talk about the oh, main... Two, two, oh. other, two, two other, a couple other comments just in the introduction of characters. I thought it was interesting that they, for, you know, it's like, why do they have to put the separation of the saucer, saucer section in here? I Okay, so let, let's talk about this because to me, it's one of the worst parts about the episode. It, 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 it doesn't fit in at all other it, than it, it, gives, it gives Riker a challenge. So again, you know, Picard gives Riker that challenge through the manual docking. So it's like, it gives, you know, it presents Riker's character as this guy knows his stuff. So Picard really needs to, you know, but, Picard still ne- needs to get to know Riker, but this guy's a pretty strong character. But is it giving a MIG pilot the middle finger while inverted? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, you know, like, yeah. it's it's such a boring scene it for is. where it's it sits. Like, and like, it, 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 there's supposed to be so much tension to it. And right. I think the tension, like, there's this weird moment where they play the theme song. I know. And like, the exactly. sl- it's going so slowly. And it's like, why are you playing the theme song through this? Um, it's interesting that we talk about the saucer separation because from, to my knowledge, they only do it twice. They may do it three times, but like they do it this episode and then they do it against the Borg and best of both worlds part two when they rescue Picard. Mm -hmm. But like, other than that, we never see this saucer separate from the ship ever again. Yes. So before we get back to the plot, let's touch on the ship real quick. Um, oh, just two other things real quick. I think it was interesting when Riker first saw Troy. That oh yeah, there was immediately a connection there. So you already everybody goes, huh? There's backstory. There's history between them. So that kind of sets that little, you know, um, you know, pursuit. You know, let, well, we have to watch in future future episodes what their relationship is. And I thought the other thing with, that wasn't bad was um, DeForest Kelly's appearance as McCoy, yeah. just to make a bridge between the original series crew and the next generation. It's crew. a it's a better scene to strangely throw in there than the it separation is. of the saucer, yes. and it's yes. it's a very very touching scene with Brett Spiner as Data. Yes. Yes. Um, I think their little interplay where like Bones looks at him and say, I don't see no points on your ears, boy. Yeah, exactly. And it's just, it's just this kind of really wonderful moment where I think we all touch back to Spock and we all touch back to Kirk. Yes. And we just, you know, there's those passing of the torch moments that you don't get often in these kind of shows, especially one as long as Star Trek. That's exactly what it was, a passing of the torch. Yes. And it's an effective one. Yes. Um, what do you think of Bones being alive at 137? Um, <laughs> what What do you think that says about medical technology in the future? On top of oh, him being alive, what does it say about medical technology in the future? I, I you know, I think it, it. I think it just, you know, kind of. Let's see. This was in 1987. It was, you know, describing what the possibilities were in terms of um, modern medical science, you know, improving to extend life. And, you know, if all things, if we did, (laughs) if kind of make an editorial comment, if we had a good healthcare system that could treat everyone and that there were, there was less economic inequality so that people had uh, equal access to quality foods and nutrition, um, you know, I think that 
it would be possible for, I mean, there's, I've seen some scientific papers that indicate that if people had the right nutrition, exercise, diet, weren't exposed to infectious diseases that, you know, the, the lifespan could, you know, get people, children that are born now could easily live to a hundred. Do you think that an expanded life in the future is a good thing for the progress of humanity? Do you think us living to 137 is, is, a, is a point that we should celebrate? Or do you think it's something that we have to weigh heavily? I think we have to weigh heavily on it because it, 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 our society would have to change radically in terms of, you know, we still have from uh, the social security system, the expectation that people would retire in their 60s. That's not possible for a lot mm -hmm. of people now. Older people are finding that they're actually physically and mentally healthy if they stay engaged in uh, uh, a job of some sort, even if it's unpaid, if it's volunteers, volunteer work and I can't think I think it comes down to a you know an income level if you if you're an older person and you live to a hundred you know where is where's the economic support going to come from to pay for your housing and your medical care and so on so it's 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 it there's not an easy answer to that because I think there's a lot of um, uh, societal changes we need to look at to, to, to really make it possible to make it work. Can, can I mention something since you brought that up and how we would have to make societal changes? Mm -hmm. uh, how old do you think Picard is when he becomes captain of uh, the Enterprise? Um, you know, I kind of thought about that because of how he, you know, I think he lists his age, his late age is described in the new series cbs access series of being 92 or 95 something like that yeah <clears throat> so i think that when he becomes the captain of the enterprise in the next generation he's probably then in his 40s 59 59 really wow. yeah and his and he's 75 in in nemesis star wow. trek nemesis wow so this brings up something that you just mentioned that Picard at 59 is still considered viable and able to be the captain of a Federation flagship going into deep space with a thousand people on board, including children, where in today's society, I'm not necessarily sure that we would give that sort of responsibility to someone his age, as you're mentioning it. Like, it's keeping people engaged and keeping people um integrated into society that they they still add and they still show how much potential they have and they can keep building on that potential yeah i mean that's a good point because my guess is if the largest you know comparable type of vessel would be you know american aircraft carriers and the captains of those ships are probably you know if they're 60 they're old because once you get to 60, if you're still a career Navy, you know, you're, you probably going to be an admiral or something like that. And you're not going to be uh, uh, commanding a vessel. Right. Um, so the first big plot point is the introduction of Q. The Enterprise yeah. is on their way to, in, to investigate Farpoint Station. Right. They're looking to make a trade deal with... Um, what was what was the name Zorn. of Zorn? Zorn, uh, yeah, yeah Gopler Zorn of the Bandy, Gopler Zorn, right. right. Um, so they run into the omniscient entity known as Q. Now Q is for uh, those at home that know is played by John Delancey, and the Q is part of the Q continuum which is never strictly defined as either a set of omniscient individuals. I'm hesitating um, calling them gods for a reason here because I have a question. 
Mm -hmm. um, or is it a single individual that takes the form of many different cues? And is the cue that we're seeing in John Delancey just a version that is presenting himself to Picard? Um, so B Picard and the crew run in the queue and Q tells them to turn back that they are unable to go forward because they are unworthy to explore deeper space. Um, essentially, humanity is not ready to face the perils and mysteries ahead. Um, this leads to Q making a charge against humanity, um, deeming them a savage race mm -hmm. or a savage child race, um, often invoking many of uh, his of our historical narratives from the past, including uh, I think he originally shows up as um, a French naval captain, and then he transforms into a World War II officer. He was a Marine captain. Yes, he was a Marine right. captain, and then he turns into a soldier from the post atomic wars, yes. which are which are very interesting to me because. Um, these apparently are soldiers who use drugs to fuel their performance in combat, mm -hmm. which, which gets into an interesting topic because Roddenberry had a lot of interest in um, the LSD program that the government was running with mm -hmm. the CIA. Uh, God, what was it called? M MK something. MK Ultra. Mm -hmm. Um it, the the future the post atomic soldiers are very MK Ultra mm -hmm. in a way, but you know we we get to the crux of what may be the entire show of Picard versus Q dealing with the idea of what is humanity is humanity savage or is humanity able to progress and evolve to the point where it's able to explore new worlds, new dimensions, new perceptions, and basically find a foothold in the galaxy, which Q believes humanity is not worthy of. Um, looking at this, let's, let's start with, uh, I think, a rather interesting question I already touched on. Is Q God? What yeah, do you I, think? I don't think he's, he's God because you know, as you said, he describes himself as part of the Q continuum. And there's no definition of what that really means, but it implies that there are other beings like him. And, and he, at one point, says, um, you know, look at all the history you have of making wars over limited resources and tribal god images. Mm -hmm. So I think that the fact that he mentions the god images, it just left me the impression that he's really not, he's not presenting himself as God, but he is presenting himself as a higher level of consciousness, a higher level being, you know, that has capabilities above and beyond what humans have at that time. Or he has capabilities beyond what humans have yet to discover in themselves, possibly. Does that put into a question to be quote unquote God or a God? Do you need omnipotence? Because Q, by all, by all argument, is omnipotent and omniscient. He knows everything that's going on, he, he can change and alter reality by us distinguishing the fact that he is not a god does that automatically take the idea of omniscience or omnipotence and maybe maybe that's something you don't have to consider when we're talking about the idea of an actual big g universal maybe outside of us god because what what you know if q reached the point of being omniscient and he's not God, what does that say about God? I, you know, the, 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 the three adjectives for God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Yeah. And I don't think 
Q fits all of those categories because not the, omnipresent. You're correct. Omnipresent. One of the things I noted at the end, toward the end of the show, when the Enterprise crew has figured out, you know, what the Bandy have done to this life force that they've captured. Um, and Picard is, you know, talking to Zorn and they're providing energy to the captured being down on the planet's surface and it's going to join, join its mate, uh, whatever the relationship is between those two, two unusual beings. It was interesting to watch Q standing behind Picard. And of course, Q is in the same Starfleet captain's uniform that Picard has on. Mm -hmm. And Q is very carefully watching Picard and listening to him because Picard ends up being the judge of the Bandai, the Bandy. Mm -hmm. and, and he delivers justice with empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and if you watch Q's eyes, it's like um, he's figuring out this puzzle. And Q at one point says, I made it too easy this time. Mm -hmm. So to me, that said that, you know, Q was making a bet that he was going to trip these humans up. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that he underestimated them. Okay. So be because he did that, that's, that's, you know, he's not, he's not omniscient. He, so, he didn't know what was going to happen. True. Um, so the charge that he levels Humans are a savage race unworthy of galactic expansion. This question is tested in the first episode, and it's actually the question that comes back in the very last episode, the, season, the series finale in season seven. Uh -huh. um, it, it, it will be the main theme. So we will actually come back to this question. So we're, people at home are probably like, why are they chewing into this? Um, we're chewing into it because this is something that we're going to be reviewing um, every so often. So I'm going to ask you, Dad, um, are humans a savage race unworthy of galactic expansion? What do you think? Um, we're a, we are a work in progress still. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things when they're in the, the court scene um, with all the, the, the post nuclear war rabble, mm -hmm. um, data tries to, you know, pitch in, he says, no earth citizen or race or forebears can be prosecuted for past events. Um, and he mentions it's a United earth. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 they're describing, you know, that, earth has become united they've you know they're not fighting wars on earth anymore um you know we learn in subsequent episodes of the next generation that they've ended poverty there's still the vestiges vestiges of, of some you know racial bigotry and so forth i mean one of the things that's interesting i made a note when the other thing they did just for fun in this episode was introduce the holodeck mm -hmm. and um, I think it was um, Data said some Data said something to Riker when Riker's talking about how an, unusual it is to have an android as a companion as a crew member, and Data says prejudice is very human. Yeah, so that still exists. So you know, in 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 this this whole point, um, you know, in 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 part of the whole you know, zeitgeist of the next generation in Star Trek, all of the different series, you know, particularly next generation is it points out, I mean, part of the thing that Q does, he's holding up a mirror to mankind through the card mm -hmm. and say, look at yourself. Where, where are you? Where, you know, you've come from your, you, you have these roots of savagery and so forth, you know, you've ended that sort of practices on your planet and so forth, but are you really past that? And, you know, part of the test is, 
you know, how are you going to figure out this uh, situation on this, on this, on Farpoint Station? Are you just going to say, hey, this is a good deal that we've captured this entity that can, you know, transmutate materials into anything you want? Yeah, we're going to keep it. We're going to have them build all kinds of starships for us and so forth. And that's again where um, Picard figures the puzzle out and surprises Q because he, you know, lets the being go, the captured being go, mm -hmm. and delivers justice with empathy. So it, it's again showing that, you know, mankind in this story can progress. It needs to progress more so that, I mean, even if you look at where we are right now today, even just mm -hmm. with politics in the United States and in the world, we have, you know, really, really bad challenges, really, really difficult challenges in politics and the pandemic and so forth. And it's a big challenge for mankind to get through this at this point. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think one thing that the show has difficulties dealing with sometimes is what is the actual point of the Federation? And necessary, and you know, there's a necessary question of what's the point of Starfleet? Mm -hmm. um, they are on this five year mission to explore deep space. What is the point of exploration besides discovering and knowledge, which Picard states multiple times, that's what they're out there for. But Q keeps pointing back like to all these explorers and saying, well, all these explorers were out here for conquest. What's the thing that stops you from conquest? And the argument is the prime directive, right? You know, we don't go to pre-warp civilizations and bring them in or alter their destinies or alter their, communities to take advantage of them however once they have achieved warp we try to bring them in mm -hmm. the question is is the federation rome and if so are their intentions of exploration purely good or just um, because this gets into a hard question I think that we're dealing with here because you talk about the progression of mankind which I agree is, is something that has, has to occur from where we are now to get to where we are to where they are in Star Trek but at the same time I, I think the, the argument that can be made by Q in this is that you're all still out here trying like you're also out here trying to take something over. You're just masking it with the idea of exploration and gaining knowledge. How many other explorers said that beforehand too? It's, it's, it's a real conundrum in relative to how can the human species advance? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you, again, if you just look at where I think we are on the planet right now, the best example probably being just dealing with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that has to be addressed together. The whole planet has to address that. And perhaps we'll come together soon enough so that it doesn't cause a great catastrophe. Um, you know, we'll just have to see. But, you know, I think that that sort of philosophically and that social political organization, you know, there is almost a proselytizing that since that's been done on earth and once Terrans, once humans get out into the galaxy and they encounter other civilizations, you know, there seem to be in the story that some, the other civilizations have a sense that cooperation is better than better than con conflict mm -hmm. and again then you extend this coming together that has happened on earth and you extend that 
throughout various sectors of the galaxy. However, the Federation comes across other civilizations that, you know, aren't there yet. Um, the Klingons, the Romulans. Well, all, and, b- both of those have their own empires. Yes, e- exactly. And, you know, with time, you know, if you follow the whole story through, you know, ultimately, you know, there is an alliance between the Federation and even the Cardassians. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, you know, it, again, there's cultural differences there so that you don't have the same sort of, you know, relationship um, among those federated worlds that are thinking more like, well, we're going to try to, you know, work together for the common good. And you're always going to find that people being people, uh, even perhaps of different humanoid species, there's always going to be diplomacy and figuring out what different, you know, thought patterns are and mores and ethics and that um, um, sort of sort of uh, thing. But at the same time, you know, one concern I always have, it goes back to a prior comment about having families on the ships. Um, you know, these, these starships have potent weaponry on board. Mm-hmm. So they are, they are, they can be exploratory vessels but when necessary, they can be warships also. Well, it's it's also made very clear early on in this episode that this is the best ship that Starfleet has. This is its newest, its best, its toughest, its most powerful ship. The weapons on this ship are the top of the line for Starfleet. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you said, you know, it is, you know, as much as you could say Columbus's ships were ships of exploration he certainly turned them into warships when he got to the west indies you know i i think there's an interesting dichotomy going on there that we kind of miss that one person's exploratory vessels another person's warship and i think you nailed that one very well um let me put it this way and i i think that this is an interesting thought experiment when it comes to the federation Let's say you're a Klingon, or let's say you're a Romulan. And, you know, you both come from these civilizations that are empires. They believe in emperors. They believe in one person above all. And all of a sudden you see the Federation, and it's claiming that it's not an empire, and that it's just there for exploration and trade and universal harmony if you're a clean on or a Romulan and you're part of an empire, how do you not look at the Federation and not go bullshit? You're an empire too. Those, those empires um, probably think just that at the same time, they're practical enough of what's the benefit of, being in the act of conflict with this federation entity or as the circumstances change is it to our benefit to cooperate with them to have some sort of defined alliance with them um <laughs> you know it, it take a ferengi attitude that what's in it for me what profit is to be made here what benefit do i get if i talk to these people if i deal with these people in some way it's interesting you bring that up there's a famous clip from ds9 where quark is arguing with a vulcan and she is no she's a romulan and they're arguing about can she wants to continue the war she wants i think she wants to upgrade weapons but he makes an argument that's basically based in the ferengi um rules of commerce that that, you know, through economics and trade, we can avoid war and have something so much better just by trading and sitting down and dealing with each other in terms of what can I give you, what can you give me, versus Mm -hmm. this idea of, oh, I own this, I have to protect this. You know, his entire, Quark's entire argument and the Ferengi's entire argument is, why are we fighting? We can just pay each other. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) Um, you know, I, I think the question of how the Federation looks 
1987 versus how it looks now is very stark for me mm-hmm. growing up in the world that I've grown up in. You know, I think before 9-11, um, the idea of looking at the Federation as imperialism is probably not something we'll have reached for. But in, in some ways, I think the Federation has... I think the Federation represents some things about America and some things about the United Nations and some of the things about NATO. Um, Starfleet is very much NATO in a way. Yes. Um, I think it try. I think next generation kind of takes the attitude of all those organizations and says, you know, if this is geared towards actual peace and exploration and sharing knowledge and sharing culture, this can work. I think the problem is it only works if everyone's on board. There's this very, you know, you brought up um, data telling Riker that prejudice is very human. And that's a great scene. There's another great scene in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, mm-hmm. where they're at dinner with um, Chancellor Gorkin, his daughter, Chang, and the other members of Chang's delegation. No, not Chang's delegation, Gorkin's delegation. Remember right. when they broke out the Romulan ale when they weren't supposed to? Yes. And there was something, um, I think someone said something about, on, on the Federation side of the table, about, you know, joining the shared humanity of the Federation. And Gorkin's daughter says, the shared humanity, even you don't even realize how racist you sound. I remember that, yes. I remember that, yes. Right. Is, and I think Worf is a very interesting, Worf and Data uh, specifically are very interesting additions to the crew of next generation because you know the entire crew of the original uh show was all human except for spock well even right. even spock's half human right. um this is the first show where you have an android and a clean on two non-humans on the show um what do you think what do you think data represents for you in terms of the overall aspects of the show and what do you think of the character meeting him here in this very first episode because i one thing that i notice going through the show is that starting here the character of data is going to go through some very dramatic changes over the first season and by the time we get to the second season brett spider is going to figure out how to act with the character but the first season of data is very like data smiles a lot and data tries to tell jokes and he laughs and like he has this weird grin sometimes and it kind of goes away after they meet lore but there there's just there's a kind of weirdness to it yeah i i think again you know this first episode encounter at farpoint is introducing characters so um yeah it introduces data and again it goes back to the mccoy scene where it emphasizes that data, you know, is an android. He's something we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't think there's enough information here for us to figure out, well, what is this character going to be like? I mean, the one interesting thing is when they're on the holodeck and Wesley slips, falls into the water because of the loose rock and data jumps in and lifts uh, Wesley off up out of the water with one hand and has this almost ghoulish smile on his face. Yeah. It's like, he doesn't, Yeah, you kind of said it, he doesn't know what emotion to express. He's trying to, he's trying to say, sort of like, I saved you, I'm help you. But, you know, he's, his, his self pride is a little bit overboard by the way he has has on his face. Well, Well, there's even that scene where, um, Dr. Crusher's examining him and he mentions that no that's the next episode I'm sorry I'm getting ahead 
Um, you know, the interesting thing about Data is that we're being introduced to a character that is basically the embodiment of an issue we're dealing with now in the modern day, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to get to the episode Measure of a Man later on in the show where we deal with the idea of is Data a sentient being, which the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, in 1987, when you're hearing the words android, that this character is completely artificial, what, what's your reaction to this? Because what, you know, Spock being, Data is essentially the Spock character. Yes. Um, um, Spock's half human. So like, it's not out of the realm of grasping Spock being half human, but like grasping him being, grasping Data being an android and essentially not being a real or biological organism. I, I, I think it was something totally new. Probably most people were intrigued, but really didn't understand what he represented. As you say, if you look back, he was representing artificial intelligence. And I don't think other than in at DARPA or places like that, the term AI was being used anywhere. Um, you know, it was just a couple of years before that people were thinking of androids more like, you know, robots like R2D2 and C C3PO. So that data was representing, you know, um, at least in you know popular culture, something totally new. Mm -hmm. Do you think that? From what you're in, from what you've read about AI, what you've seen and heard about it, do you think an AI like Data would be a good thing? And this, we'll, we'll get into this conversation later on when they introduce the character of Lore, um, because then we're going to get into the very difficult question of like, get, you built a bad robot, then you built a good robot. <laughs> How did you do that? Um, but in, in general, do you think producing an artificial, an artificial being like data, given where we are now and what you know now, is necessarily a good thing? Um, it can be depend on how it's used. Mm -hmm. For instance, in medicine, there's a lot of artificial intelligence that's being used to examine various uh, medical images. And they're able to, part, in some cases, uh, see and diagnose disease conditions that, uh, you know, physicians may not be able to see. Um, you know, there's talk of, you know, having um, artificial intelligence or you know, robots is the right term that could be caregivers. You know, there's, I think the biggest concern is, you know, do you create some sort of artificial intelligence? Um, do you weaponize it? And it gets into the whole, you know, Terminator series, the whole concept of if you, if you advance, if you, if you weaponize AI, particularly with information technology, that's, you know, the heart of it. Is it going to be able to get out of human, human control? You know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a IT mechanistic Frankenstein. Well, I, I think the, I think you hit on something really important there. If you let it get out of human control, by all definitions, data's out of human control. Data sentient. Data can make his own decisions. Data is choosing to serve in Starfleet. Data is choosing to not kill Wesley Crusher when he kill when he lifts him out of the water. Data is choo you know, data could foreseeably walk through the halls of the Enterprise and take everyone out. Um, he you know he can compute trillions of you know, trillions of trilohertz or the, you know, huge amounts of data instantly. 
Is it? In some some future episodes when the biological units are threatened and they have to shut down, he's given responsibility for running the ship because he's not subject to the radiation or the toxin or whatever that the humans are suffering from. And, you know, the other thing that's, you know, this kind of jumps ahead, but it just, you know, it makes you, it, 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 put, it makes you wonder in terms of if you look at the progression of scientific thinking and science fiction thinking within the whole Star Trek genre, mm-hmm. look where AI ended up in Picard of last year. Right. Where Picard actually becomes a synth. Yeah. Well, that gets into the very difficult question of, okay, data is definitely sentient. And we know that we can transfer. And Picard, by the time that show comes around, and since he is a quote-unquote golem, um, is data. and, And Picard actually discusses data having a soul and all of that. But if you build, if you build a machine like Data and you give it sentience and you give it, you know, he later on gets an emotional chip, an emotion chip. Mm-hmm. If you give him all that, did did Doctor Soon just create a soul out of nothing, essentially? Boy, I mean, that gets into, that just brings up a huge metaphysical question in terms of if you know a created sentient artificial intelligence based being can be given a soul then where did biological humans get a soul from well and is and it and is this and you know what is the soul is soul merely and not i shouldn't say merely but is a soul yeah really consciousness well i so there's um a professor named um i forget his first name penrose but he he studies consciousness and you know there's a lot of discussion now about uh our reality being a simulation mm-hmm The one thing that he has discovered, however, is that consciousness is not a computation. While you could look at everything else in the noble material universe with a mathematical equation, consciousness cannot be defined mathematically. Hmm. So getting into the question of like, is 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 our soul our consciousness? It brings in the question, you know, you said, is data given a soul? One thing I think one question that we may want to ask, maybe not is data given a soul? Does data assume a soul? That might be the better question. Do we assume souls? Like, you know, I think it gets yes, because if you look at evolutionary biology, you know, does a single celled organism have a soul? Does a Mm. cat have a soul? Mm -hmm. Does a lower level primate have a soul mm. is it the point where you go from a chimpanzee to a human or you go from a um you know a a homo you know <laughs> one million years ago you know in africa did that that was that is that was that humanoid ancestor was it aware of its own sentience that did it have a soul or is that a point where in terms of biological evolution and the evolution of consciousness that a soul shows up which Mm -hmm. kind of gets back into the metaphysical metaphysical question is what the hell is a soul anyway i think we'll be coming back to this question a lot when it comes to data um so moving on as as we noticed, they, they get to Farpoint Station and they discover that the Bandy and Groppler Zorn have basically kidnapped this um, creature, this mm-hmm. jellyfish-like creature that can transform its own matter and also create matter out of um, essentially nothing. Mm-hmm. 
and using the same energy from their transporter array to feed the creature and heal it, they are able to help the creature lift itself from the planet and rejoin its mate. Mm -hmm. um, you're a biologist. What do you think about exobiology in space, uh, giant jellyfish holding hands through the cosmos, and where do you where do you rate um in terms of being a star trek fan this this moment i you know i'm trying to think back at the the original series whether there were any entities of this sort i can't remember specifically i think there were um you know it, it it's a real stretch in a way that <clears throat> You know, if you had an organism, you know, that large and many of these, you know, that, you know, the one, the one thing at the end of the show, when it showed the two mated jellyfish like creatures moving off, it's like, well, how do they, of course, I guess the question of how they propel themselves through space, they could turn themselves into a ship and that could probably be capable of warp speeds and so mm -hmm. on. So, you know, that, that's, that, I don't have a good answer for that at this, at this point. Um, you know, it gets into questions of, is all organic life have to be carbon-based or mm -hmm. because of its closeness on the periodic table, is there, is it possible to have silicon-based life forms? Which, like, like we see in the crystalline entity. Like the crystal Enli or in the Horta in the original series. Oh, true. Yeah, the Horta. Um, so, and then, and then it gets into, you know, this is kind of a real stretch, but, you know, it gets into, you know, what some, you know, um, uh, scientists thinks, and some of these are pseudosciences also, to think that, you know, what UFOs represent are trans-dimensional, um, you know, trans-dimensional beings that are coming from a different space and time. I, so, you know, if it, so if there's any, I mean, that's really in a sense, that's why I say it's pseudoscience. I mean, some of that might have a basis in quantum physics, but it's very much to me, science fiction. But again, you know, one of the things about science fiction is that it can point to what could be developed in the future, what could be understood in the future. I agree. I think, I think these creatures touch on some very interesting concepts and questions that we have about the universe. First, is life strictly planet bound? Do you have to have an M-class planet to produce life? Or can you have creatures that live outside of a breathable, workable, organic atmosphere like these two creatures, which are large and immense creatures floating through space. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, to kind of answer your question, I kind of imagine that these creatures can generate their own warp bubbles or their mm -hmm. own energy fields. So that's how they're kind of moving through things. Um, I think xenobiology, especially in science fiction, is very fascinating because it, it deals with the idea that space itself is an act, is a natural environment too. It's not just this kind of void full of irradiation, dark energy. It's, it's an actual jungle to itself. Well, there's, there's two interesting scientific points is I read recently that, you know, you think if you go up into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere, that it's sterile. There are bacteria that can exist and they can be cultured out of the air, way up in the atmosphere. Um, the other thing that is just, you know, is not biologic, but I read an article recently when both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 went outside of the heliosphere into the, the beginning of deep space, of interstellar space. They found that the electron density in interstellar stellar space is higher than what it was 
within the the you know within the heliosphere mm. and you know scientists were, had been surprised by that and they don't totally understand it and that gets into we i don't think we still understand what dark matter is which I was you know, like you know, we think that you get into the space between the stars and so forth that there's nothing there well you know there <laughs> We don't know what really is there. Another thing, interestingly, you know, I've read recently that if when people, astronauts, cosmonauts go into the International Space Station and they get exposed to somehow space outside their controlled human environment, that space has a particular smell to it, mm -hmm. like burnt toast or something like that. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, what are they smelling? You know. So it's it's interesting that you bring up that we don't know a lot about dark matter. Um, I was wa watching this thing recently with Ben about dark energy and dark matter and what they think it is. It, it turns out dark matter actually might be dark, m maybe may might be a form of gravity. So it might be better to term it dark gravity. But the interesting thing it brings into the question of, okay, there's space and there's space time. And somehow these things are all interconnected together. Mm -hmm. And one, one theory out of many um, is that this dark gravity or this dark matter, this dark energy is what is basically adhering space and space time together. Mm -hmm. And that you have dark energy and or this dark gravity in varying densities throughout the universe so the adherence between space and time thicken and thin as you go through the universe which makes um which actually makes something like interstellar travel via a warp drive uh a very interesting phenomenon to pull off which we'll get to later in a different episode but right. you know I, I think one thing as it pertains to these creatures you know we we really don't know so much still about the universe it's just like we still don't know a lot about the bottom of our oceans mm -hmm. um there's still so much possibility out there that when I see episodes like this where we are dealing with these interstellar creatures that aren't only familiar in some sort of earth-like shape like the jellyfish they're also they also have the ability to like communicate with humans or humanoid creatures like the bandy because you know they never really say are the bandies human um, I always assume that you know the bandy kind of are human but they're able to communicate with the bandy. Troy's able to communicate with them emotionally through her uh, empathic powers as a, as a betazoid. Right. And they're clearly capable of this higher kind of consciousness of feeling pain, of feeling gratitude, feeling remorse, feeling joy, of being back together um, when the two mates are finally reunited. You know, I think there are so many interesting questions asked in this episode about the potential of life in the interstellar universe mm -hmm. outside of planets mm -hmm. that you know i the I, I watched this episode three times to prepare for this recording and i kept just kind of coming away with it that you know not only is there a possibility of this wonderful beautiful diverse myriad of life out there but Picard, somewhat in answering Q, as you said, judging with empathy and bringing justice with empathy, also realizes that he's somewhat a steward of the galaxy. And the crew themselves realize that they are kind of stewards of the galaxy. And that it is, you know, wrong for the bandy to be holding this creature captive and using it for exploitation, especially for trade. And it, it's very much a animal rights episode if you look at it, where the crew's basically saying, like, you know, you it's not only that you can't abuse a sentient life, we're not going to let you 
abuse this animal life that is traveling out here in the galaxy. We have a responsibility to that too. And I, I find that to be fascinating. Yeah, one comment that Picard made to Q toward the end, and my note is that it was Picard turns the tables on Q when he says to him, why do you use other life forms for your rec- recreation? Mm-hmm. Which, which it, you know, is interesting, but it also goes back to whether Q is God because, again, Picard turns the tables on Q at that, at that point. Right. And, and just about what you're saying, you know, the last note that I made, and we don't have to stop talking, but, you know, again, where Picard kind of loosens up to Riker at the very end, and Riker says something, the effect says, well, Captain, do you think all of our missions will be this challenging? And Picard says, no, I think they'll be much more interesting. <laughs> Let's see what's out there. Yeah. Which when he says, let's see what's out there, that that is, you know, that's the end of the episode, which is very much a continuation of Kirk, because I think that was the last thing Kirk said in at the end of the undiscovered country. Yeah. Well, you know, I think and we, we can end this here, um, sure. though I, I do think that there are some things that we can. There is one thing I do want to talk to you about that has to do with Star Trek now that we're here. Um, but leading off the show, um, what a big debate that's happening right now within Star Trek fandom is what do you think, what people think Gene Ron's Gene Roddenberry's vision was when the show first got started versus what the show is now with Discovery and Picard and Lower Decks. Um, I've always thought that Gene's vision was that we would look up into the night sky and that we would look up to the stars and we wouldn't be afraid. We would be hopeful that we would see our future, our destiny, and an opportunity to be part of something greater that that the universe full of all that star stuff was in us and that we were just going home the moment we leave this planet and we go out looking um what do you think gene roddenberry's vision is and what how do you think this episode or the next generation capture it you know i think from the reading i've done about him in the, you know, the limited amount of information I know about his thinking or philosophy is that he wanted to present a positive future for mankind. Um, you know, he developed the whole genre, uh, you know, in the 60s, which were a very turbulent time. Mm-hmm. The Cold War was in full swing. Um, you know, it's like everyone thought that World War I would be the war to end all wars. And all that did was set up World War II. So that was like World War II was, World War I was Act I and World War II was Act II. And that went right into, you know, capitalism versus com- uh, communism. And he, he, I think he wanted to present a picture of, you know, we can evolve to something better. Mm-hmm. And, and part of it was, since we were, you know, starting to look at travel into space, just, you know, orbit the earth and then go to the moon, he was, he was, he was, you know, as a science fiction writer, he was, you know, painting a picture of how things could be. Mm-hmm. And I guess what you're saying is, you know, when you talk about the discussion within Star Trek fandom is as we've gotten into some of these later stories, genres, Picard, you know, um, Discovery and so forth, it's shown that the universe as we get out, as we go out into it is to some degree gonna be a continuation of what we've had to do here. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, so, but before we go, um, Yay or nay on Encounter at Farpoint. Do you like the episode? Do you dislike the episode? 
I I like the episode because I think it is a good, you know, first episode of a new iteration of the Star Trek genre. I think it's a good introduction of this new crew, this new ship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, gives enough depth into their character so that you can get interested in them. And if you, you know, then, you know, watch the series back in 87 through 93, you know, whatever the number of years were, then you could, you could really understand how the characters develop. I mean, mm -hmm. I've seen that when I've, you know, as I said, I've been watching the Enterprise series and, um, you know, I've seen a lot of changes in Jonathan Arch Archer. Um, a lot of, it, it's very interesting, the whole relationship between uh, Tucker and uh, DePaul mm -hmm. and so on. Um, um, the relationship between, the, the, the relationship between Earth humans and Vulcan very much changes during, um, during, uh, enter, uh, enter, enter, yeah. Enterprise. So it's setting this episode is setting up all the more good fun things just from an entertainment perspective that can be seen as you pursue the story. Yeah. Um, okay, so kind of getting off Star Trek for a moment. It seems this year in the news there is a lot of talk about UFOs. And you and I don't really talk about, in our private conversations, we talk a lot about politics and economics and spirituality and all that, but we never really talk about UFOs. Um, what do you think is going on with all of these sightings happening in the news? And I, I, have, a, I have a feeling that this year or, or the next, the U.S. government or some government around the world, as it's already happened in Israel, um, I, I think that we are going to have a confirmation of uh, uh, non non human life. Well, funny you should ask because <laughs> one of the things I was going to talk to you offline, but it can be part of this, is that oh, it should be on Amazon Prime. A, a movie called um, Encounters, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. Mm -hmm. And there's this guy who's a physician, Steve Geller, I think that's his name. And he talks about how he's created this organization called CE5. And he's very much into meditation and <clears throat> has a lot of, you know, Indian meditation philosophy and so forth. So that what what a lot of the ufos are are extraterrestrials but they're transdimensional they're from a mm. different time different <clears throat> part of the universe not even maybe this galaxy but if you but if you set up your mindset if you if you meditate and make yourself open to them you can actually communicate with these people and he's got these videos of people going to in like on the Outer Banks in North Carolina, in you know Sedona, in places in Florida, where people are gathered together and they're meditating, and they see these lights just spontaneously appear in the sky, or during the day they'll see, you know, clusters of UFOs and all of this sort of thing. And you know, I, I just it's it's a long you know movie discourse discussion, almost two hours long. I didn't finish it. And I thought, I'm going to Google CE5. So I did that. And it kind of, it has, there was a Wikipedia article that kind of discounted it said, this is nothing but UFO porn. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, I can see how that is. And, um, but, and one of the things he posits is that there's a conspiracy by governments that they really know and they have known that there are extraterrestrials that have visited us. And he makes the claim that like, there's this underground facility in Arizona where they've got five different extraterrestrial spaceships they've captured and they've got- Okay, know, so you have heard of this guy, okay. In prison there and all of this sort of thing. Oh, that's and, different. And, he, and, and he's saying that, you know, the reason that the governments don't want to tell us the truth is because, um, that it, it would threaten their control. 
you know, they're the powers that be, it would threaten their control. Now, so, fact, one thing he said was kind of crazy. It had something to do with the King of Luxembourg or something that was in this and that you know, probably a good Roman Catholic where he said, well, we want to manipulate things so that when the public, humankind knows that there really are extraterrestrials, we want to, we want to kind of tie it into the second coming of Christ. And I'm thinking now, if this UFO porn is the coming of Christ, that seems to me just as nuts. But so, you know, but it, you bring up a good point is why did the Defense Department and the U.S. government release these videos of the Navy jets chasing the UFOs? I think that's probably happened many, 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 many times before, but it's never been made public. So two things. Um, since we're recording this, we, we should probably review for the audience at home listening to this and for Ben later on years down the road where he's like, what the hell are the, what the hell are Pop Pop and Daddy talking about? Um, so, so one of the things that happened, la- I think it was end of November, was that an Israeli, a former Israeli defense minister came out and did an interview where he basically said that world governments are in cahoots with these alien civilizations and they have been for years and that essentially this goes back to world war ii and i have heard one one of the bigger alien conspiracies i've heard is that we've been in cahoots with aliens since world war ii and in fact we were in cahoots with the good aliens because hitler was in cahoots with the bad aliens but then you have to believe that hitler dies in 1955 um you know, I, I think we're, I think putting all the conspiracy things to the side, and I think the conspiracy thing is exciting for people to get into, because it's a lot easier to digest, and it's less boring than the truth. Um, and I don't think the truth is boring, I just don't think the truth is going to be as exciting as people think it is. Um, I don't think that we're, su- I don't think next week or at the end of the year, a UFO is going to come down and an alien is going to come out and we're going to hand them flowers. Like, I don't think that's what the government's going to say. Oh, like, like the, like the scene from uh, Men in Black. Men in Black. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think we're suddenly going to be talking to Bebop 5 at the end of the year. Well, see, and the other thing that's interesting that this, this, this um, CE5 gentleman says is that the um the way that aliens have been portrayed is generally that they will be hostile that there'll be a threat that yeah. they'll be similar and hawking even said this is that we really maybe shouldn't be putting you know messages out inviting people in because they when they come they may not be like the vulcans they'll be like columbus coming to the new world whenever whenever you have a superior a more advanced civilization coming upon a less advanced, generally the less advanced loses. That's, that's sort of the principle. But what this guy is saying is that he talks a lot about consciousness mm-hmm. as, you know, related to energy. And you know, he mentions quantum physics an awful lot also. Well, that's so, a, that's the thing for a lot of those, a lot of the people who are into conspiracies have also gotten the quantum physics too. Right, because a and, lot of people try to use quantum physics to validate some of their unscientific and, viewpoints. Right, right, yeah. Well, yeah, I can see they just say, "Oh, it's just quantum physics." One of the things he presents in this film, "Close Encounters of the Fifth Con," is that Ronald Reagan, as president, when he spoke to one of the sessions of the General Assembly at the UN, he said, "What would happen if we had an alien visitation?" that we had to deal with. And he didn't say whether it was good or bad, but he said, wouldn't that bring us all together? Because we would see how we all are one together. And, you know, the point was like, why did he say that? And, you know, Reagan, I, from what I hear, having lived in California while he was president, he and Nancy were very much into, um, you know, having their fortunes read and, you know, all of this. Oh, yeah. 
they were very much into that sort of thing oh the reagans were into that occult scene like yes well like people forget alan parsons was like <laughs> heavily into into occultism and alan parsons was basically the american who helped founded our you know establish our rocket technology um seriously pe- people a lot of people don't know this and there's a show um about alan parsons but a- alan parsons was this rocket engineer who practiced european black magic <laughs> his spare time in california with these with like 10 to 15 people in these huge cult rituals i'm i'm dead serious too um and he had government clearance and everything it's, it's kind of crazy if you think about it but you know um I have a friend named A.J. Hartley, who's a New York Times bestseller, and he helped write um, a series of sci-fi novels with Tom DeLonge, who's the lead singer of Blink-182, who believes in UFOs, like Die Hard. And one of the people they um, got to talk to, I need to look this person up real quick, so if anyone... Go ahead, yeah. um, Chief of Staff... no not i'm trying to remember um there he is well that's his picture john podesta john podesta was a advisor to obama no so john podesta was a chief of staff to the hillary clinton campaign too that's right yeah yeah so i bring up john podesta because john podesta during the clinton administration pushed really this. hard for the declassification of ufos yes i remember this. like yeah. he believes this right i think that the government by the maybe not this year maybe not next year but in our lifetimes i don't think we're going to meet aliens but i think they're just going to confirm that they're real like at this point there's so much video evidence out there of things in the air maybe if they're not aliens maybe they're trans-dimensional beings but I, I just kind of have this feeling that we're kind of edging up on something here as a society and that, you know, the media is starting to talk about it a lot and it's starting to show up on CNN a lot. It's starting to show up in newspapers and on the internet a lot. Um, you know, I, I think that we're really kind of on the edge of confirming that, extraterrestrial and, life. Yeah, and that, and that brings up, you know, just gets into the whole, you know, getting back to star trek and what it represents is if that is confirmed you know it's been thought that you know if you know aliens came down and they landed and they weren't hostile but they just you know that it would just it would you know most people on the planet are very uh earth centric still Mm -hmm. It, it, they're kind of like instead of thinking that the sun revolves around the earth they most people know that that isn't the case anymore but a lot of people think from a particularly religious standpoint that we're it god created us and we're it yes and if somebody the, the mind game that i've already played is if somebody came down from andromeda from a planet Mm. and they landed here and they were friendly and we talked and they said well what and we asked them what's your religious beliefs he said well you know we we really don't have any he says and they said well you know don't you believe in jesus and they said and they would say who's he Mm -hmm. and that would blow people's minds because so many christians believe so firmly believe in jesus as being universal yeah but what would may happen is you describe jesus philosophy or buddha's philosophy Mm -hmm. or the um the um the bhagavad gita yeah and And they get it say we understand that we believe in the same thing yes and that goes back to Teilhard de Chardin, Jesuit philosophy of Christogenesis. Yes. That if aliens came down and they confirmed what Jesus represents, that's going to blow people. The people are not going to be able to understand that because they're going to have to shift their whole 
thinking of religion and so on. But once we could get past that, it would make it could make a big difference of how we relate to one another. Well, it you know weirdly this does get back to to this for to encounter at far point because it gets back to the question of Q. Q's an alien. Um, what if these aliens have this kind of a power that looks like om- omnipotence to us? And you know what if they were friendly and what if they wanted to share that? And, you know, it really did transform how we view ourselves in terms of our own individuality, how we see each other and our greater human community. But also, you know, you, you brought up the point of us being very earth centric. Um, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, just because, you know, everything that's going on in the country right now, especially with Trump trying to contest the the election and the real difficulty of watching so many people kind of just line up to the idea that that's okay. Um, I think that there is this kind of human centrism to us as a species, as a species that I don't think it makes us savage. I don't think Hugh's right when he says that we're a savage race, but we're maybe our inability to progress is that we still haven't found the ability to see the universe to see ourselves in the universe because you know i i made i made a point earlier on that you know i think gene wanted us to look up and see that the same star stuff that was out there you know the molecules of the universe are in us you know we should be able to look out into the stars and see ourselves there well, yeah, you bring up a kid. That's a good point because it's the same thing that the Apollo astronauts perceived when they made the trip to the moon and they could look back on the earth and they had a completely different perspective of our place in the universe. And if you can go to, and this has happened, you know, I think that one of the deep space probes took a picture from, you know, the outer planets back toward the earth and showed it could demonstrate earth as a small dot. Mm-hmm. And if you really think about that. Oh, we're a speck. We're a speck in the universe. Exactly. We're, we're so, so small. And, you know, I think that, I think you're right about that, that if you, if you can look at, if you can lose that prejudice about being so earthbound, that can make a big difference. The other thing, you know, bring about this, if there's going to be some public revelation that aliens do exist, that other civilizations, other entities other than humans do exist, who's, who's controlling that really? Yeah, who controls that narrative? Who, it, or, because, you know, is if, if there's this greater consciousness Are we Mm. in control or are the aliens actually in control? So there's this podcast I I listen to um, by this MIT scientist named Lex Friedman, who his entire specialty is AI. But um, he was talking to a physicist. I forget the guy's name, but they were talking about God. And it's interesting. We're talking about Q um, and you brought up um, uh, omnipresence. You know, if, let's say all of our reality is a simulation, which means these, these aliens would be part of a simulation as well. Um, if there is something of a God, it lies outside of our perceivable, knowable material universe. And technically, and I'm probably going to get some shit for this online. Um, I often struggle with the idea that maybe we should include in our material universe the ineffable things that we perceive internally. Because, you know, we, you know, we could look at it as that we only have these mortal shells to let us know that we are perceiving. Like, these are our sensors. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe that these are the only things that let us know that our consciousness is real and that it exists. Um, you know, if, if you look at it from the perspective that the, that the Earth is so small within the universe that we're a speck of dust on the cosmic winds, mm. um, 
it can make you feel really small and make you feel really little. But I, I think the... I think the thing is that Picard is able to look at those creatures and the crew is able to look at those creatures and see themselves in those creatures. And that's the act of compassion that divides us from human savagery. The ability to see, and in some ways it's Gorkin's daughter, it's kind of a smack back in the face of Gorkin's daughter. Um, you know, she says, you know, you, you say our united humanity, how racist. And it's like, well, yeah, our united humanity. At least we treat. At least we're willing to treat things that don't look like us better than you Klingons are. You know, you'll stab it with your batleth. We'll, we'll at least send it home. Um, I think that if we do have confirmation of uh, extraterrestrial life, especially intelligent, sentient extraterrestrial life, I think a lot of people. I think a lot of people will be scared Mm -hmm. because it really will, like, especially people in our family. Um, I think they'll be scared, but at the same time, I think that if, if they haven't blown us up yet, and if they haven't enslaved us yet, like they can't be that bad. And if they, if they aren't starving us and you know, that's the thesis of the CE5 group. But at the same time, you know, you brought up Reagan um, being in all that stuff. Reagan still believed in trickle down, trickle down economics. Do these aliens believe in trickle down economics? Like, I don't think so. <laughs> what, what do they think about the NASA budget? Like, no. <laughs> I have questions. Right. Um, but on that, we're going to um, end this episode here. Uh, right. One thing I just, once you saw that we're just dust in the cosmic wind, if you wanted to have some music to play, before the podcast in the end you could go to kansas dust in the wind i love that album um but dad thank you for coming and being yeah we'll do this again soon with um good spending this time with you yeah yeah the next episode is the naked now which is uh star trek next generation season one episode two we'll be back to review that next time thanks everybody bye good night bye-bye